purpose of this lecture is to give you a, an overview of the law of outer space. Um, the beginning of the beginnings of space law uh, can be found traced back all the way until 1910, where a Belgian lawyer named Emile Laude um, mentioned the concept of space law. He didn't write an extended treatise on it, but mentioned the, the idea that uh, at some point uh, mankind would be reaching beyond airspace uh, and into outer space. And then at that point, there might be some legal issues that would have to be addressed. Uh, so he kind of opened the door to further exploration of that idea, but it was still early on. It was still a uh, fantasy to think about uh, entering space at that time. Um, slowly, there were, there were other expressions of interest uh, in the 20s. And then the first monograph, the first book on space law, uh, was published in 1931 uh, by a Czech lawyer named Vladimir Mandel. For Prague. And he wrote, not in Czech, but in German, and published it in Germany so it would be more widely accessible. Uh, and in this book, he uh, really uh, laid the groundwork, raised a lot of uh, questions, and uh, provided answers to uh, a lot of issues that ultimately uh, laid the foundation for uh, the modern law of outer space uh, issues of uh, liability. Assertion of sovereignty by countries over celestial bodies, uh, the need for states to supervise activity in outer space, uh, the question of uh, where did space begin, uh, and so all of those uh, questions were were explored more thoroughly by Vladimir Mandel, uh, and then more and more interest uh, grew around the, the area of space law, uh, but it was a hypothetical issue until we actually began to use outer space. You all know when that began, in 1957, when uh, the Russians successfully placed uh, the Sputnik satellite in orbit. Uh, and that woke the entire world uh, and brought us into the space age. And soon after that, the United States uh, uh, placed uh, its own satellite into orbit, and off we, off we went. And not soon after that, uh, we began to develop uh, the principles of space law and to establish them as uh, international law that would govern the activities of, of countries in space. Uh, and that law took its uh, initial form uh, in the shape of a declaration of principles. Uh, not a treaty, but a declaration of principles uh, that was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations in 1962. Um, um, many of the principles that were espoused in that declaration were eventually codified in the first space treaty uh, that was adopted in 1967, uh, which is generally, has a longer title, but it's generally referred to as the Outer Space Treaty, sort of the Magna Carta, the fundamental foundational document of international space law. Uh, and both the principles and the Outer Space Treaty um, laid the, the groundwork for space law, and established the principles that uh, space was to be freely used by all countries. Freedom of exploration was to be promoted, started, uh, and that it would be used for the benefit of all mankind, uh, and that no country would be able to assert sovereignty over outer space or over any uh, celestial bodies, uh, that there would be no uh, uh, appropriation of celestial bodies, uh, that it would be impossible for a country to plant a flag on the moon and claim it as their own. Uh, it also asserted this initial Outer Space Treaty also asserted the principle of the, the peaceful use of outer space. Uh, discussed liability, that, that states would um, bear international responsibilities for their activities and the activities of their nationals. Uh, would also bear liability for any harm caused by outer space activity. Um, it called for states to supervise their nationals' activities. So not only adhere to the principles of international law, uh, in governmental activities, uh, but if uh, private entities uh, were to be involved in our space activities, the countries were to supervise that activity and ensure that it was carried out in accordance with international law uh, as well. So already in this, in this early treaty in 1967, when the, the only players in outer space were governments, uh, there's already uh, some understanding that private entities would move into that, into that realm at some point. Um, it called for, the Outer Space Treaty called for uh, states to register uh, their 
and the assets uh, that, that were placed into outer space so that there, was, there would be transparency uh, because there was concern, of course, for uh, the military use of outer space. And so you can ban the military use of outer space and place limitations on it, uh, but just knowing what's up there and how other states are using uh, space would give uh, countries comfort. And so it required that uh, every state establish a registry uh, and keep a, a list of what they put into space. Um, and in connection with that, uh, the, uh, the Outer Space Treaty uh, asserted that uh, a state would have jurisdiction over whatever uh, space objects were placed on its registry. Uh, jurisdiction and control. And then in connection with that control, have the duty to supervise uh, any uh, objects that are placed into space. And so those concepts of jurisdiction, control, and supervision are tied closely together. Uh, states are expected to uh, have the ability to regulate uh, space activities. Um, so the Outer Space, uh, the outer space uh, Treaty also addressed the rescue of astronauts, uh, which was a concept that was um, important to the spacefaring uh, nations at that time that if uh, astronauts were placed into space that they would be treated as envoys of mankind uh, and they would have a special status uh, so that they would uh, enjoy the, any assistance from other states in the event that there was a, an accident or a disaster and so every country uh, that signed on to the Outer Space Treaty had a duty to uh, rescue any astronauts. Um, now each of these uh, concept was then, this was a foundational document, the Out Outer Space Treaty, but then each of these concepts, or a number of them, uh, were further elaborated on through subsequent treaties. So we had the Outer Space Treaty in 1967. Uh, right away in 1968, uh, there was a treaty that was concluded on the rescue of, uh, of astronauts and the return of space assets. So this was something that was uh, uh, completed in, in great haste. Uh, it was clearly something that was great importance to the United States and Russia, which were the space-faring countries at the time, uh, but it was included, uh, concluded immediately after, after the Outer Space Treaty. It only took them a year uh, to get it together, and it's been criticized uh, as being uh, drafted in haste, and, uh, and as a result, contains certain imperfections, according to some commentators. Um, so that was 1968. Um, in, uh, Soon after that, the third uh, treaty was drafted, and that was the Liability Convention. And the Liability Convention uh, elaborated on uh, the responsibility of countries for any damage that was caused uh, by uh, their activities in space. Uh, the fourth treaty um, was drafted in 1972, and that was the Registration Convention, and elaborated on this duty to uh, keep a registry and to transmit the information contained on the state's registry uh, to the United Nations. Uh, so then it, there would be greater promulgation of this information and greater transparency. Uh, and also explain what type of information had to be shared so that there would be uh, greater uh, transparency with respect to space activities. Um, and then there was a, a, a fifth treaty, a fifth multilateral space treaty, uh, the Moon Agreement, concluded in 1979. Uh, which addressed in particular the moon uh, and other celestial bodies. Um, and it solidified a number of the concepts that were already present in the other trees. Uh, the duty to rescue uh, any personnel uh, that were in distress on the moon or celestial bodies. Uh, and it also applies to orbits around these celestial bodies to provide assistance to them uh, and to return uh, air and spacecraft. Uh, it also uh, reasserted the, the need for, to use the moon and celestial bodies in a peaceful manner. Um, but it went further than that as well. It also uh, contained the non-appropriation principle, that no country was going to um, assert uh, claim to the moon. Uh, however, then it addressed the issue of the, uh, the use, the extraction, and exploitation of natural resources. And it stated that uh, these natural resources were to uh, be subject to regulations that would be developed at a, at a later time 
by an international body that would be assembled. Uh, and that was very controversial. And the Moon Agreement, while all the other space uh, treaties, the Outer Space uh, Treaty, the Liability Convention, Registration Convention, the Rescue Agreement have been widely ratified um, by many countries, uh, the Moon Treaty has not been. It's been uh, signed by only 13 countries and none of the major spacefaring countries. So it seemed to be a failure uh, and not uh, as a, uh, added to the body of space law in a significant manner, although it is law for those countries that have ratified. So those are the main uh, space treaties that, that make up space law. Um, but in addition to the treaties, there's a customary international law, um, which uh, comes into play in a couple of areas uh, of international law. And, and it comes into play with maybe the most fundamental aspect of the first question that you might ask when studying space law, which is, uh, where does space begin? Where does space begin? Uh, there's some, uh, under some situations, that might not be a, a difficult question to ask. You know that if you are orbiting the moon, then you're in space. Uh, and you know that if you are in an airplane uh, at 30,000 feet, you're not in space, you're in the air. Uh, but it becomes a more critical question um, if you are in low Earth orbit, or you're in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, uh, perhaps in a space plane, and you know, that, that question is, is raised anew in the uh, context of Virgin Galactic and the other space tourism companies, uh, which uh, will be conducting suborbital flights. Uh, will they actually make it into space, or will they just be in the higher reaches of airspace? Uh, where exactly does space begin? Uh, and you think that that would be addressed by an international treaty and there would be a limit set so that you'd know when to apply air law and when to apply space law because the principles are different. Space law is it's a unique field. Uh, it has its own body of laws, its own rules. Uh, and so you have to know well, which one applies. Um, but none of the treaties do address it. They talk about space and space objects, um, but don't explain exactly where space begins. And so uh, this is an area where customary international law might provide an answer. And where do you, how do you develop the customary international law? Uh, by looking at practice. Um, are there, can you find uh, examples of uh, state law where states have decided and they've acted in a manner uh, where uh, you can determine where they view the, the limit of outer space? Is there, a particular, uh, is there a particular practice that's been observed uh, by countries to apply space law uh, at a certain point? Uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, there, are, there are commentators that have argued that point, and this uh, issue of the delimitation of outer space has been uh, debated uh, extensively at the international level of the United Nations uh, and by scholars and other, and other groups, but uh, there's still no clear answer. Although, um, I think, uh, a consensus, if you were to uh, identify a consensus, uh, you would find the limit of outer space to be in the neighborhood of uh, 100 kilometers, or about 62 miles above the surface of the Earth. And that, uh, that line, that demarcation, is generally referred to as the von Karman line. Uh, and the idea of what happens at that point, um, and that, that point where this happens shifts, so it's not always that exactly uh, 100 kilometers above the Earth. Um, but uh, at a certain point, uh, the atmosphere is so thin uh, that you can no, no longer get aerodynamic lift from an airplane. And at that point, if you're still airborne, if you're still flying, then you're not flying according to the, the, phys the, uh, the physics of, of an aircraft, but you're flying uh, because of the physics of a satellite, because you're going so fast and then you stay aloft uh, against the opposing centrifugal, uh, centripetal, uh, centripetal force. Um, so it's a, uh, a definition of space that relies on physical analysis. Now there are other ways that you might uh, try to define the limit of outer space. Is it when you no longer feel gravity? Is that when you're in space? Um, well that would, uh, you know, when does gravity disappear? Uh, you still have some gravity uh, beyond 100 miles. 
you know, in 200 miles, 1,000 miles, our gravity, even though it becomes weaker and weaker, uh, it extends uh, very deep into what we would call space. Uh, and so that is not a, a very good approach to it. Uh, is it when uh, there's no longer any air? Well, where does that happen exactly? Uh, the air gets thinner, the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner and thinner. At what point is it, is it a total void? Uh, there are different approaches to that. Um, another approach that's been taken to the de delimitation of space is, is what, are the, what is the function of the, of the craft that you're in? Is it a craft that's designed primarily for flight in airspace, or is it designed for, uh, to reach and operate in outer space? And if it's the latter, then you should apply space law uh, to the operations of that vessel. Uh, that's a functionalist approach. Um, but it's an area that's not perfectly set. What are some of the other great questions of space law? Uh, property rights. You probably have all uh, heard about it. Um, companies that sell plots on the moon. And you can buy them, and then you can own part of the moon. Um, is that possible? Is that legal? Can you own uh, part of the moon? Uh, and the answer to that is, is no. It's no, you can't. Uh, those companies uh, will sell you novelty items. You can uh, take their deed and you can hang it on the wall. Um, but you uh, don't have any property rights in the moon. Uh, and why is that? Um, it's because uh, there's no claim to sovereignty. There's no national appropriation. And individual property rights uh, rely on uh, your state's claim to the property and your ability of the state to uh, exclude, to give you exclusive use of that property uh, and exclude others from it. But if the state doesn't uh, have a claim to the property, uh, then an individual can't as well. So um, you could go and uh, if you tr travel to the moon, you might stake out a claim and you might try to exclude others. Uh, and if they refuse to leave, you take them to court, uh, but no court uh, in the world would uh, decide that you have property rights. Um, well, then there's a greater question of uh, mining of asteroids, uh, which has come up recently, and that's a more uh, open question that's been debated about whether those, uh, that non-appropriation principle would prohibit uh, a private company from extracting resources from an uh, asteroid and taking them uh, and doing what they will with them, asserting ownership over those resources. Uh, and that's an issue that's uh, been debated and there are arguments on both sides. Um, what about other uh, uses of space? Uh, what about the military use of space? What limits have been placed on the military use of space? Uh, the Outer Space Treaty talks about the peaceful use of space, uh, but it doesn't place a strict ban on the military use of outer space. Uh, there is a ban on nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction in orbit. Um, but there's no ban on placing conventional weapons on a satellite. Uh, there's a continuing debate about whether that's permissible or not. And under the plain language of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, it's hard to see that that, that ban exists, uh, but there are people that argue that uh, there is a ban on that through a broader interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty and perhaps through the operation of customary international law again, uh, due to the practice of states. Um, it could be argued that states have shown through their practice over the years uh, that they don't believe that that's legal and it's not proper and they don't do it. Uh, and if you can show that widespread, repeated practice over time, uh, then you could argue that there's a customary international law uh, that prohibits the uh, placement of conventional weapons in orbit. Uh, but under the plain reading of the treaty, uh, that's permitted. Um, but to what extent could we, if we agree that conventional weapons aren't permitted in space, to what extent uh, can the military use the space at all? We know that the military does rely heavily on space. It relies on space for uh, telecommunications, for GPS, uh, for other uh, infrastructure needs, uh, remote sensing. Um, and so we, we know that, that uh, space can be used to, to some degree. Um, but where exactly is that line? Uh, that's a question of debate.
well. What about the free use of space? Can you, um, can a country fly over any other country and position a satellite and begin to observe freely uh, what's going on in that country? Is there a right uh, to spy uh, on your enemy from space? And the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, it's one of the fundamental concepts of space law is that um, we can all use space freely. And it's one of the um, differences, distinctions between space law and air law. Uh, you can't fly over another country in your airplane without that country's consent. Airspace is owned. Um, countries assert sovereignty over airspace up to the limit of outer space. And at that point, sovereignty ends, and you no longer need the, the consent of the country to fly over it uh, with a satellite. And so you are able to position satellites over, uh, over an enemy's country uh, and observe them. So that, understandably, uh, raises concerns about militarization. Because while observing a country is one thing, uh, positioning a satellite with uh, weapons over a country uh, is quite another issue. Uh, and so that raises the, the question about to what extent can you militarize those satellites. Now what about liability? Liability in the space. What are the rules? What are you liable? Is it simply an extension of the, the, uh, the tort laws that we're familiar with uh, here in the United States? Uh, well, the Liability Convention uh, addressed that issue. Um, and the regime that it establishes uh, imposes strict liability on any damage done by a country's space assets, either on the surface of the Earth or in airspace. So if a satellite re-enters the atmosphere, which they do frequently, and usually there's no damage done, but if, it, if uh, a satellite re-enters the atmosphere and uh, falls to Earth and destroys a building, uh, the country uh, that launched that satellite will be strictly liable for any damage caused. And the same is true uh, if the satellite re-enters the atmosphere and strikes an airplane in flight for strict liability. Um, but the rules different for damage caused in outer space. For example, if uh, two satellites collide, uh, is there strict liability then? Uh, no. In space, uh, liability uh, is only imposed uh, if the country was at fault. Uh, and there the debate begins, exactly what that means to be at fault and what that requires. Um, it can be difficult to control satellites be aware of uh, other satellites that might be uh, in, in your uh, satellite's path, path. And there may be collisions, and there are collisions. Um, and so at what point does fault arise? Is it merely a failure to observe best practices, to take every um, opportunity to avoid collision? Uh, when does fault arise? Um, that's not made clear in the treaty, um, but there is that requirement to, to show fault. And the Liability Convention also establishes a procedure uh, to pursue in the event that there's liability. The countries are uh, asked to try to resolve it uh, diplomatically, uh, but if it's not resolved within one year through diplomatic means, um, in accordance with the rules uh, set out in the treaty, uh, then a claims commission is established, uh, made up of three members that will then uh, resolve the issue and issue an award. Now, um, what about uh, liability caused by debris? Uh, one of the most serious issues, the one that uh, takes up a good deal of time at the, at the United Nations level, is uh, the issue of orbital debris. And you hear about it frequently on the, the news. Um, you know, recently, it's the astronauts on board the International Space Station have had to uh, move into their uh, little life, life, lifeboat, the Soyuz capsule that's docked at the International Space Station, um, and uh, wait for some debris to pass by 
that was dangerously close to the International Space Station. And it is constantly engaged in, in uh, maneuvers to avoid debris. Uh, we track debris very closely. Uh, multiple government agencies track debris. Uh, it's, a, it's an enormous problem. Uh, uh, we share that information and we're able to detect when larger pieces of debris, um, maybe five centimeters or so, uh, are coming near the space station and then engage in invasive, invasive maneuvers and the, the space shuttle had to do the same thing when it was still flying. Um, but are, is a country uh, liable for the debris that it creates? Um, perhaps. Perhaps if you can show that, that it engaged in in some sort of uh, improper activity that would render it to be at fault. But you also have to be able to attribute the debris to a particular country. Uh, and that's more difficult to do. Uh, it can be done, uh, but uh, say for example, a country blows up uh, one of its own satellites. Uh, and we then track all of the uh, debris pieces uh, that were created by that explosion. And if they strike another satellite, attribute fault to that country because they uh, destroyed intentionally uh, their satellite and created the hazard. Um, that theory hasn't been tested uh, yet, um, but it's a possibility. It's one of the challenges of debris because a great uh, a large portion of the debris that's uh, in orbit uh, is unidentified. We don't know where it came from. Um, and it washes across the orbits and uh, is uh, creating a greater and greater hazard at some point, uh, it's been theorized that as the debris collides with itself and creates more and more debris, a smaller pieces of debris, that eventually the Earth will be encased in debris and will no longer be able to, to use the low Earth orbits. Um, and the, as, uh, the debris that's in the higher orbits take, can take hundreds of years to, for that orbit to decay and re-enter the Earth and, and burn up. And so, uh, that's sort of a doomsday scenario. Hopefully we don't get there. Um, and in the meantime, um, uh, lawyers are talking about uh, not only liability to deter uh, bad behavior, such as creating massive clouds of debris, uh, but also uh, rules and best practices for mitigating debris. Uh, and space agencies have their own uh, mitigation guidelines in place, uh, and some model uh, guidelines have been promulgated as well. Now what if uh, your spacecraft is struck by debris um, and uh, your, dis your spacecraft is disabled and you go plummeting down the earth to Earth and you crash land in, a, in an unfriendly uh, country and um, you need to be rescued. Is there a duty for a country to, to rescue you and to return your spacecraft to uh, the launching state, the launching authority? Uh, there is, and, and that's detailed in the rescue uh, and return agreement. Uh, and it requires, you know, it's motivated by a humanitarian impulse uh, that we're to treat uh, astronauts uh, uh, with particular generosity and to ensure their safety uh, and to, uh, if at all possible, to rescue them return them to the, the launching state. Um, some questions that arise in that context is uh, when exactly does that duty arise? What does it mean that, if possible, um, is there a duty to uh, rescue astronauts that are in orbit and suffering from distress? Um, there are some linguistic problems in the treaty uh, that don't make that perfectly clear, but it also raises the question, just because it is um, potentially, you know, strictly, in the strict sense of the word, possible for the United States to, to uh, launch a rocket. It would cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do so, and so is the United States uh, required to uh, expend that kind of money to rescue astronauts that are in distress. Uh, and does it apply to and now private uh, actors? Uh, let's say there's a, an orbital uh, space tourism company and something goes awry and you have uh, passengers private individuals that are trapped in their orbiting space station. Uh, does the duty to rescue them arise? And that's a, a linguistic uh, issue uh, that some have struggled with. Um, 
And one of the things about the uh, rescue and return agreement, uh, which makes very expensive rescue impalatable, unpalatable to the state potentially, is that there's no uh, provision for compensation. So states are expected to rescue uh, astronauts and do it for free. Out of a feeling of, of brotherhood, brotherhood of mankind. Um, some have proposed that that, uh, that provision be the treaty, that duty be amended uh, to uh, require compensation uh, so that that would motivate uh, countries to engage in rescue operations if necessary. Uh, there is a duty to uh, compensate uh, a state that, that rescues or retrieves and returns your spacecraft. Uh, that's a different, a different concept and motivated by different concerns, uh, but it's also part of the rescue and return agreement uh, that a country is obligated not only to rescue astronauts, uh, but if possible to retrieve uh, your space assets, your spacecraft, uh, and to return it to you. And, and what is the motivation uh, behind that? Uh, uh, primarily the protection of uh, technology um, and the need to, um, to you know, not only to gain possession of very expensive technology uh, that's been lost, uh, but also perhaps uh, to prevent the spread of technology, um, space technology, which can be often used for dual purposes, not only for civilian purposes, but for uh, military purposes. So there's that concern that uh, they should be uh, returned and returned promptly uh, before they're reverse engineered and that uh, military, potentially military technology uh, falls into the wrong hands. And we see a different expression under domestic law uh, for that concern under export control laws, uh, where uh, space technology is very tightly controlled um, so that it doesn't fall into enemy hands. So those are the five uh, fundamental space treaties. Uh, but there's been a sixth international space treaty uh, that's just recently been concluded. Um, and that is the Cape Town Convention on International Interests in Mobile Equipment. Uh, and it, it really uh, launched a new era in the field of space law because it's the first treaty uh, that dealt with private activity. It's still an agreement between states, uh, but it sets forth a, a regime uh, that those states will then, through its domestic legal system uh, apply to private activity. And uh, it addresses the, uh, the area of asset-backed finance. Uh, and it was uh, it's part of a project that was uh, launched by uh, UNIDLOT uh, in order to enable uh, companies to more easily afford uh, new fleets of aircraft, which are extremely expensive, maybe a quarter of a billion dollars for a new jumbo jet. Uh, it's expensive, we want to facilitate that financing so that uh, the aircraft manufacturers are able to sell uh, their new uh, generation of aircraft. Uh, and that's done more easily if you can develop a law of secure transactions, which makes it easier for a creditor uh, to, um, to enforce a security interest and, and take the aircraft as collateral in the event that the, uh, the borrower uh, defaults on a loan obligation. Uh, that was extended to enable them to buy the aircraft. Uh, and so this, this uh, treaty came into force with respect to aircraft, and then uh, two uh, new protocols were drafted, not only the aircraft protocol, uh, but the uh, rolling stock protocol to apply to trains, which are all also, also uh, highly mobile, right? They come across the uh, borders frequently, uh, particularly in Europe, where they're constantly going across borders. And so you need an international secure transactions regime rather than a patchwork of, of individual ones. Uh, and then there was a protocol written for space assets uh, to create this international regime for the enforcement, uh, enforcement of security interests for satellites and other space uh, objects. Could be space stations, could be you know, launch vehicles, space planes, um, and, uh, in order to enable creditors, banks, to loan money uh, to particularly startups who it's, it will be most beneficial for because the established space companies have very deep pockets and are already able to finance their acquisitions um, 
without the use of this treaty, but startup companies uh, need, will need to rely more heavily on the, the collateral they have, and all the collateral they'll have, or, or most of the collateral they'll have, will be uh, the space asset that it, it makes up their business, their space plan, for example. Uh, and so they have to rely on the collateral uh, in order to uh, attract a loan at a low, a low cost, a low interest rate. Uh, and so this uh, Cape Town Convention and the Space Assets Protocol uh, will make it easier for them to do so if it's broadly ratified, uh, because then wherever that uh, space plane ends up, whatever country it might uh, be in, or whatever country from where a uh, satellite may be controlled, uh, would be uh, required under uh, this new convention to assist the creditor uh, in uh, gaining possession of it and being able to enforce its security interest against it. Um, and so this is a new uh, type of treaty, radically different from uh, these five existing space treaties. And one of the interesting uh, topics that emerges from it, and one that um, a number of commentators and scholars have explored, which you might explore, is uh, how does it fit into the existing rubric of uh, international space law? Uh, because it contemplates um, uh, space activity that's quite different from the type of space activity uh, that was considered when these original space treaties were drafted back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we're no longer talking about uh, governments placing a satellite in orbit and that government controlling uh, and using that satellite for its entire life. Uh, now we're talking about private companies um, uh, purchasing a space asset uh, and potentially losing it to a creditor in the event of default, and then that creditor selling that same space asset uh, to another company. Uh, and now suddenly what we're faced with is the transfer of ownership of, of a, a space asset to multiple parties. And does that fit with the existing concepts of uh, assigning liability? Or because the liability, uh, under the liability convention, uh, will go to the launching state. Um, but is it fair to impose liability on the launching state if it's uh, lost control of the satellite, if it's been sold to some company um, uh, in another state, and the original state from where it was launched really has no connection to it whatsoever? Uh, these are the types of tensions uh, that now exist uh, as we enter this new commercial space age. Uh, but we're still governed by the, the old um, rules of space law uh, that were fashioned in a time of governmental space activity. Um, now, in addition to the international law, uh, there are a host of uh, domestic uh, regulations uh, that we won't get into in any great detail uh, right now. but. Uh, there are licensing regimes. Um, uh, not, not all countries have a domestic space law, but more and more uh, are drafting and adopting uh, domestic space law as more and more countries are becoming uh, active in space. Um, and part of that is to uh, adopt licensing regimes for when you can launch and operate a, uh, a space vehicle, um, or the, the use of orbital slots, for the use of radio frequencies, um, the ability to uh, sense remotely um, from outer space using remote sensing satellites um, for the, the export of space technology, um, um, for the uh, uh, most recently, the most recent developments in the United States and then the adoption of regulations on a regulated human space flight uh, in the run up to the new space tourism industry. So this is a a new body of regulations that's just recently come into being. Uh, and now the FAA is in, involved in studies uh, to prepare for the enactment of regulations to govern uh, private activity in orbit, because there are companies uh, not only planning to uh, send private individuals uh, up in orbit and back uh, in a quick flight, but put them into orbit, um, put them into orbit, um, and some companies are even talking about uh, more than that, sending uh, private individuals into deeper space to orbit the moon and go on multi-week or multi-month journeys. Uh, and right now, there are no regulations in place 
uh, that govern uh, activity, private activity in orbit. Uh, and so that's that's being looked at so that um, these individuals that go up into, into deeper space uh, don't go into a, a lawless area. So that's a quick overview of the, uh, the basic nature of space law. And we'll be exploring uh, each of these areas, or a number of them, in greater detail uh, in our future classes. So thank you all for coming.